Okay, so before we start, let's just meet the main sponsor, it's XTix, uh, and I'm Luis, or Luis Watch, uh, head of engineering at XTix. Uh, we are making a, a huge push to kickstart this, this uh, meetup group, uh, but this is not a, an XTix group or an XTix meetup, so if you guys want to co-sponsor or help us organize, uh, reach out, and, uh, and we can try to do some, some more fun stuff together. So feel free to do it. It's not an XKix group. By any means. Uh, XKix is a, is a company focusing on delivering engineering capacity. So to, to projects and, the, and the projects, we, we have a, a, vast, a vast stack. So on the back-end side from Golang, PHP, Java, Python. Probably forget some, but JavaScript, Node. And then on the front end, uh, Angular, uh, React, and, and Vue. Uh, we are more, I don't know, probably around 100 engineers by now. Uh, we have three offices in Portugal, so Lisbon, this one, uh, Lady, and Viseu. Currently, we have more than 15 active projects and, and clients, and we tend to do a lot of stuff on, on the Medium and, uh, and the YouTube. Uh, as I was saying, we focus a lot on community. Uh, this is actually a photo from the first, the first cloud uh, Kubernetes meetup uh, that we organized. Uh, um, yeah, our networks. If you want to to check what we are doing in terms of engineering, you can check our Medium, YouTube, GitHub, and, and Twitter. And if you guys want to check how it's live at text, you can follow LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, being community even is part of our DNA. Like I was saying, so uh, this is really important uh, for us. Uh, and if you guys have any ideas of new meetup groups, like whatever it is, Elixir, I don't know, GoLand, whatever, JavaScript, reach out to us and we can help uh, co-organize these this meetups. Uh, yeah, let's get into the to, into the meetup. So today we have annual events that will present game on how game days get you get you rock solid Kubernetes clusters. And uh, yeah can grab some, and after this we'll have some food and drinks, we'll order some pizzas, and uh, yeah, uh, since summer is coming, we'll stop for the next three months and we will get back in September, uh, so yeah, we will see you in September, <laughs> and yeah, that's it, it's your turn then. <laughs> Sorry, Albert might be here. Uh, hey everybody, I'm really excited to be here with you today and we'll, we are going to be talking about game days and how to get rock solid Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> and so before we start, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm Anna and I'm a crappy incident responder. So there you go. If you were wondering why I'm talking about incident response, it's because I'm a crappy responder overall. And so I'm a self-taught uh, front-end engineer that then became somehow a full lifecycle engineer owning services and having to be on call. And right now I'm the engineering manager at the Master Labs. So I'm managing a cloud native team. And uh, let's talk about incidents. And so when I'm saying that I'm a crappy incident responder, it's not just in the engineering incidents, it's everything in life. So all sorts of incidents, I'm somehow a very crappy responder. And so I wanted to share an example with you so you have an idea of how bad I am. And so 13 years ago, I was at home with my family. And so my father was in the living room my mother and I, we were in the kitchen with my brother. And we were all watching this TV show uh, that some of you might know, which is Gat Kudret. Mm. And so for those of you who have no idea, I decided to translate that. And so we were watching Smelly Cats. Uh, well, it's a comedy show. Overall. And so 
we were laughing at this very funny sketch, and my father has this weird laugh. I don't know if you know anyone like that, but it sounds like a helicopter. <laughs> it's like, something like this. And so he's laughing very hard. He lost his breath. He passed out. He fell off a chair, and he hit with his head on the rock. And so I'll just pause for a second for a spoiler alert. It's fine. <laughs> but it was a very dramatic situation. And so it seems like we had an incident. Um, my father created the incident, or it was the incident, actually. And so we heard this big noise, and my mother opened the door, and there was blood everywhere, and my father as well. And she immediately took the, in the first responder and incident commander role. So she immediately started to assess what was the incident, how to contain and mitigate it, and she gave me a very clear order. And I will remind you, I'm a crap responder, right? So probably not the best person. And so she just told me, go grab a cloth. And so I went. And I grabbed the most disgusting thing that I could find. And why? Because why use something nice to clean the floor full of blood, right? So I just came back into the living room. Hero saved the day face on. And she yelled at me. Because the club was not to clean the floor. We were trying to stop the bleeding. <laughs> of course we were. And so I was sat in the corner and someone else was taking care of things. And so that's how bad I am with incident response. But then a few years later, I started being on call as an engineer. And so for those of you who are usually on call, you might remember the stressful situation of going on your phone and getting those incident alerts. And usually the first message is kind of okay. As soon as you start receiving calls, something is really wrong. And so how can someone like me survive on that type of environment. Uh, and usually there are three types of reaction I have on incidents. Either too quiet, I'm vac on vacation mode, which usually means that the monitoring is not accurate. And so I'm just in denial at this point. Uh, I have this mode where I'm just going across and coding a lot and making sure everything is okay. Or Everything is on fire, and at some point it's like, okay, let everything burn. <laughs> or there is another situation for the third one, which is when you have those false alerts on, and so at some point you no longer know if you are on a real incident or if it is just noise. And so incident response is like any other skill. It requires practice and training. And so how do I train for an incident? Should I just start breaking stuff? Well, short answer is yes, you should. And there are a lot of things that we can break um, in our products, and I'm pretty sure that you can all think about things that you want to break in production. But the question for me is, why breaking stuff in Kubernetes? And so Kubernetes is a complex system. And I think the simpler we want it to be for people, the more complex the system becomes. You have a lot of different components, a lot of interactions, and there are a lot of behaviors that are not consistent with uh, traditional systems that existed before. And so complex systems also require modern monitoring. And so when we think about uh, Kubernetes, Things are very short lived. You have pods being created, being created, being renamed, being created, and so nothing is static. You cannot have a static picture of what's happening uh, overall. And then, since you have tons of components, you also have tons of metrics that you can monitor. And so, metrics have costs, and it's difficult for us to basically keep an eye on everything. And then, it's difficult to observe. So since it's very dynamic, it's difficult for us to assess what's going on at all times. And so you might say, okay, but monitoring can be a bit easier. Yes, you can think about a ton of different resources that actually help you have an idea of what you should be monitoring, like uh, Google Golden Signals, it's just an example. 
But even if you follow one of these things, the question is, are you confident that you are monitoring the right stuff? And so it seems like people are complex, and you can use me as an example. Our requirements are complex. The system is complex. Monitoring is complex. Uh, some people actually talk about socio-technical uh, complexity. And so why doing this? And you might be thinking, oh, this is a great place for us to have incidents, right? Yes, but this is also a great playground to train incident response. Because we know that with complex systems, chances are that we are going to have incidents. So what better place for us to break stuff rather than a complex system? And so I'm going to be using an example from my current company uh, of an incident. This was a real incident that happened. And so uh, it's 11.39, and we received one of those emails from Google saying that one of our services, in this case, Poopception, was down. And so you might be wondering what Poopception is. It's not that relevant for the story, but... Basically, it was our internal service that was generating uh, clusters for developers. It was mostly an internal service uh, based in K3S, um, and the service was up. And so, uh, some minutes later, one of our engineers goes on Slack and tells us, hey, I think the service is down. Okay, and I'm going to be the incident responder, I'm going to be the incident commander, and I'm going to declare the level of risk here, the severity. And when we have these internal uh, services down, usually they are not impacting users immediately. But it's one of those things that if the incident persists over a long period of time, it's going to start impacting customers because you want to release new stuff and you are not able to generate the clusters to test or to do your CI or do demos before releasing. Um, and so it goes on Slack again and confirms that there are no urgent releases happening. Because if they were, the problem would be even bigger. And so a minute after, he actually tells developers, hey, there is a problem, just don't use Coopception, Coopception is down. And then a couple of minutes later, the questions start, right? And so you notice that the Coopception service was not running the pods. And so you reached out to Engineer R. And who's Engineer R? Engineer R was the creator of the service. But it turns out that Engineer R is surfing in Siberia. And so it's, it's a weird choice of place to be at. But uh, the reality is that the engineer responding to the incident couldn't find information in the run book, and so he wasn't aware of how to scale the service again. And so fortunately, some minutes later, another engineer in the company actually had a bit more insight over the service and was suggesting to just scale the perception back to one. And so that's what the engineer A did. And so the moment we were waiting for arrived, which is Google Cloud said the incident is resolved. And then some minutes later, we could declare the incident is resolved. But then the timeline is not over yet. And so 30 minutes later, there is another uh, engineer saying, hey, game day is over. And so, engineer R, we can come back from your surfing trip in Siberia right now. And so, what was really happening here? Well, first of all, if you probably were wondering, yeah, it was fake, the surfing in Siberia. I, will, I think there are people doing it. I will probably not recommend it. <laughs> um, but what happened was... Um, Behind the scenes, the incident actually started a few minutes before being declared. And so behind the scenes, engineer F actually attacked the company. And so it still took reception to zero replicas and then asked on a DM uh, for engineer R to take a lead to go. Uh, 
Um, and then in the middle of the fire, while engineer A was trying to assess what was going on, he actually did something else. So he double checked with the engineer R that it was not causing damage that was going to persist for a long, a long time. He went ahead and he also deleted clusters for a couple of the engineers in the team. And why am I mentioning reassuring that they could recover from it? Because just because you are breaking production, you don't want to do it in a way that is going to ruin something for life. And so we'll talk about the planning of this, but you should not be doing stuff that will make your company burn to the ground. <laughs> just for the sake of practice here. Uh, and so the reality is that after the incident was declared as over, engineer F still didn't know if engineers were capable of recreating their clusters again, because no one had tried to do it. So they were probably not even aware that the clusters were gone. And so he nudged engineer A to ask if they could recreate because he also wanted some information about that process and if there was something wrong with that part. And so this is actually a game day practice. And so there is a very fancy definition, but in reality, game days are planned incidents in production. So that's all we have. And why breaking perception in this case? Because there are so many services in the company, we could have broken anything. Usually everything starts with motivation. And so in this case, Poopception was one of those services that was very new in the company. And it was created by one single engineer. And everything was very new about it. The runbook was new. Uh, there was not a lot of operation behind that. The cluster it was on was very uh, internal because the goal of that particular service was supposed to be internal as well. But one thing that the company was noticing is that people were actually using that service for more than it was initially intended to. And so all those things made this particular service a good candidate to get uh, attacked, let's say. And so usually we also have hypotheses and questions that we want to ask ourselves before attacking something in the company. And so in this case, a couple of questions we had were, is the cluster where these services at the right one for what it does? Uh, are the monitoring and alerts enough? Is the information on the runbook uh, accurate? Do we need to have more information? And if engineer R actually goes to Siberia for surf, can we assure that the company continues to exist and can handle the incidents? And so after running the game day, we actually realized that at least three out of these four questions resulted in corrective actions. And so we actually needed to improve a couple of these things. We needed to have a better run book, in, improve the information we have in our repositories. Um, we also did uh, some adjustments in monitoring to make sure that we were not just receiving an email. Um, and then there is a plan as well when we start game days. And usually it's the four <laughs> basic questions, which is what, who, when, and how. So in this particular incident, are we attacking a service? Are we attacking a product? Are we attacking a process? Um, what are our hypotheses? And then takeaways and cost. And cost is important because if we are breaking something in production, we have to be aware of the cost benefit. So if we are impacting users or impacting services or impacting other stakeholders in the company, we always want to make it very clear what's going to be the cost for the company. And then we have the main characters in the story. And the first one is the game leader. And so at least at Ambassador, anyone can be a game leader. So if one of us has a great idea of how to break something in the product, we can offer ourselves to be the game leader. And all we have to do is come up with a plan. And if we don't know how to break it, at least find someone that can break it for us. And so this is something really cool, uh, a, a really cool thing to do. 
And then we have the experts. In this case, it would be engineer R. And usually those should be our accomplices because we don't want to be testing something while the expert is on call. Because if we really want to understand how the company reacts in a, an incident situation, we want to make the situation much more open to get through learnings. And if we have the expert on, we might not be benefiting from some of these learnings because we are assuming, okay, engineer R knows exactly what to do. So those are great accomplices. And we've had cases where we actually had to create accomplices along the way. There was one game day where our CEO, which was also not aware that there was a game day happening, started to jump on call and was kind of letting the incident into a different direction. And so at some point we had to decide, okay, it's going to become an accomplice because we don't want to create that much stress and get the game day in a different situation. And then we have the unlucky responders, which are usually the on-call engineers that react to those incidents. Uh, we might have stakeholders, reviewers. Um, in our case, director of operations is the one giving the thumbs up of a game day, but depending on the impact on the company, you might have someone different telling you if it's okay to do so. And so then you have the how. So how are you gonna trigger the incident? When do you think that the game day is going to be over? And then the other two are one, the nudge. So if you think that the engineers are going in a totally different direction that is not going to validate, um, any, validate any of your hypotheses, you can have some ways to lead them into a different direction. And then the last one, which is the halt, is imagine that for some reason you need to stop the game day. So you cannot stop the company. And so that's called like plan B or making sure that whatever you are breaking, you know how to can break in the future. And then the when. Uh, and depending on the company, this might be important for, for you to have an idea. The first game days that we did, they were not a surprise. So we were planning the game day and saying Wednesday afternoon, at some point, we'll have a game day. And those were great because we were assessing mostly our processes. Right now in the company, we are on a stage where we are assessing the systems more. And so our game days are actually full surprise mode. And so at any point in time, you can have a game day on and the company doesn't know about that. And so benefits of game days. The first one and the one that we saw in this particular example is if you have a new service, a game day can be a good way for you to validate how the service is behaving, if the monitoring is okay. Um, whenever you have something that was already uh, an incident before, game days can also be good for you to verify if your corrective actions really helped. So in this case, we could actually break the exception again, just to validate if all the corrective actions we got the first time were actually helpful and if the incident on a second time would be a much more relaxed and successful uh, incident. And then the third one is to calibrate the overconfidence. And so I'll give you another example. Our last game day was about security. And so um, one of the engineers had their credentials stolen. And so one of the first things that one of the engineers told was, oh, I bet this is fake because that engineer would never allow this to happen. And so when we hear something like that, we already know, okay, this is the good door for an incident. And so Overconfidence might be the thing that ruins us in an incident. And so whenever you see those signs in the team, signs that some services are really solid or some people are really responsible, that might be an indication that that's a good thing to try. Uh, and then it reduces stress in future situations. I say future situations because during the incident, it might still be stressful. 
And when I talk about overconfidence, the reality is that we want people to be confident, but prepared. And so if you are wondering, where can I start building a game day? One of those places or one of those people. And it's not about pushing them, <laughs> uh, but it's about putting them under the pressure to try to assess if our systems and our processes are working properly. And so I'm talking about incidents and how to do incident response, but the reality is that it's not about the incidents in the end of the day. What we want to achieve is solid products and reliable services, right? And so even if we think about uh, the pyramid style uh, that Google uses for uh, service reliability, we always talk about incident responses being the second layer. So we have monitoring, the incident response, then post-mortems and the learnings you get from incidents. But when you see things in a pyramid, it seems like they are not really connected. And so each step is a different step. But putting it on the side and looking, for instance, to our security reliability cycle, the reality is that incident response actually impacts all the other layers and is impacted by the other layers as well. And so every time we have a game day, we do corrective actions, we learn from them, we iterate processes, then our metrics get better with incident response, hopefully, but usually, yes. And then the next time you have a game day, everything starts again and you are iterating on top of that. And so incident response, in the end, it's about incidents, but there are a lot of things that you can do to prep for incidents that are not exactly related with incident response in the end of the day. And so I talk mostly about the incident response. And so game days are actually part of chaos engineering. And for those of you who don't know about these, Netflix was the creator of chaos engineering. So they had a great uh, product going on, it was Chaos Monkey, and so they were writing stuff in production very early on with a lot of success, and so game days are one side of these. We have fire drills, so we can also break stuff in staging environments and in more controlled environments than production. We can have training sessions and we run books and postmortems, and all of them impact the way we prepare ourselves for incident response. And so to recap all of these, uh, incident response is a skill, and so we can practice and train it. Uh, the best way to train and to run game days is to get small controlled experiences. So you should not aim at breaking the entire system at once. I would not recommend you that. Uh, and you should have a solid plan and hypothesis on and the last one is game days make the systems more reliable. So in the end of the day, that's what we want with game days, even though it's really funny to come up with an example of how to create our product without anyone getting met. <laughs> but the reality is that what we want is more reliable services. And so in case you were wondering, I am still sometimes a crappy responder. I'm just less crappy than I was <laughs> at every new incident. And so are the systems. The systems are getting better at, at every time. And so if you have any ideas about how to break the systems, I will be the game leader of my company very soon. So I'll be open to suggestions. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Questions. Do you want to ask questions? <laughs> I'll go. Okay. <laughs> so um, I imagine that this obviously has some impact on revenue. So uh, I'm just curious, how often, how often do you trigger SEV1 and SEV2 <laughs> game days, for example? Because I imagine those are not that easy. And those are the ones that you want to mitigate at the end of the day and respond, and respond fast, respond faster. Mm -hmm. But I imagine that they are not that easy to convince C-levels or management layer to approve them. Yes, that's a great question. So I'll say they are not done as often as the others, but that doesn't mean that we didn't have cases of that. 
I think for those, the important part is for you to have a plan. And so the reality is that when you have a high severity uh, incident, you also don't want to drag it for too long in the company. So you might have a severity three incident going on for like two hours or three hours to assess something. But if you are talking about severity one incidents, you might have to do more of the nudge and a little bit of work on the background to mitigate the incident or to let people mitigate the incident sooner. Because you don't want to spend like five hours just trying to understand if people are going to be able to do it with those sorts of incidents. So that, that's a great question. But you can still do it. Uh, but usually you have to be very specific in terms of what exactly do you want to test. And especially because sometimes those severity incidents, depending on whether you want to test the service or the process, you might not need that type of incident. Because imagine that in the end of the day, what you want to assess is something related with processes. There might be other types of incidents that might lead to the same conclusion without having to get that amount of risk. But it shouldn't yeah. be the case all the time. I have one. <laughs> uh, are you thinking about going full automated and just crash stuff? Fresh stuff randomly or? That's a great question. At this point, no. Uh, but in the future, we might go that direction. Uh, right now, given the size of the company and the way we operate, we still don't see that as being the priority. Uh, but in the future, we might go into different types of chaos engineering. We are being successful with game days because those are controlled and they are not happening all the time and allow us to have a lot of flexibility because it's not about just the system. It's about the, a lot of other things that we have in the company. Um, and even out of curiosity, one of the things that I, I see more happening with the engineers is as soon as you get a very solid process and you have a lot of checklists and run books, it seems like Sometimes engineers just focus too much on the process. And so they lose the picture and they rely too much on those checklists. And if you have, for instance, an incident on a checklist, it shouldn't be a big deal. But that's enough for engineers to feel a bit out of their comfort zone because they are already relying so much on the process that they don't think about what it is, the immediate stuff. Like I did with the plot, which is to mitigate and contain the incident. That's why we have the process a lot. Um, but yeah, we might get there. What was the most effective game day that you had and why? That's a tough question because I think all of them were good to assess something. I'd say probably the last one in security uh, just because we were able to confirm a lot of different things. Uh, because it was fascinating the amount of things that you can do without being traced immediately. <laughs> uh, and uh, not only that, but we also realized that there are a lot of assumptions about security. Uh, as I was mentioning before, the fact that some engineers think that the others are so careful that even if they have access to a lot of different things in the system, it's not going to be a problem even if they always have their walls up. I think that was a good game day in terms of culture of the company for us to understand that we probably don't all need access to everything. And those who have access, there are still back doors that people can go in to access a lot of things. And so it's not just about getting access to stuff, it's also about as not knowing immediately that someone get ac got access to them. So I'll say it's probably one of the game days that I enjoyed the most. Yes. <clears throat> what do you do? I mean, if you don't tell people in the second time, mm -hmm. um, has there been occasions where people do that? Real incidents that they need to get in there. No problem, they will match us at some point. <laughs> That's a great question. I don't think so. I don't think that happened. And the reason why that usually doesn't happen is because 
Games is not happening in production. And so you are impacting real systems and real users, so no one has enough time to guess if someone is going to jump in or not, because in, in between, something real is actually being affected. So I don't think that's usually what comes to their mind. Uh, some of them might be thinking, is this a real incident or a game day for a second? But that usually doesn't impact the response because since it's happening in production, it doesn't matter in the end of the day. We still have to figure it out fast. Have um, you ever broken the system just a little so it's something like like introducing a higher error rate or introducing some kind of block, something. So not exactly break things, but degrading uh, part of the system. That's actually a good question. I'm not sure if any of our game days were above that. So if you weren't, I might steal your suggestion right now. Because <laughs> the reality is that Thinking about real incidents, we had a couple of instances where our time to detect was really high because it was something that was degrading over time and we didn't see it immediately. But I'm not sure if we had a game day that was planned in a way that you would start the incident way before you thought someone was going to catch it. So yeah, that's a great suggestion. More questions? Thanks, then, once again. <laughs> yeah, just stay around. There's either coming against the <laughs> and there's 